Welcome to the Sutherland Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's good to see you here. Are you grateful this morning? What are you grateful for? Grateful for the day? What, for life? Love of Jesus Christ. And his sacrifice. Well, I'm thankful this morning for the word of God. You know, we have uh, a listing of 28 beliefs that we espouse, endorse, believe. The first one is what? The first one is the Bible. I would encourage you to make a copy of these 28 fundamental beliefs. Number one, the Holy Scriptures. The Old and the New Testament are the written Word of God given by divine inspiration. Isn't it amazing? This book, Divine Inspiration, the inspired authors spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and the infallible revelation of God's will. Just think of the great counsel that we are given for living in these closing days of Earth's history. What a blessing it is to read and to study the Word of God. And what He has determined well in advance is most important for us to know. And what He would like us to do with the information that we learn. I hope that you have made the decision to avail yourself of this divine source of information every single day. It's crucial to your progress toward the promised land. Soon we will be home, but we're not there yet. There is a storm brewing at present, the likes of which we have never seen before. As one of God's own unique children, Determine in your heart to study and to pray to be ready. A few weeks ago, you may have heard a sermon entitled, Snares of the Fowler. Do you remember distortion, distraction, and deception? Well, today's presentation will be a little spin-off of that sermon, as you will see. You know, some of the most fascinating details that have been provided for us in the Bible are given through the wide assortment of human personalities and their associated stories. Uh, when my brother Luke is up here right now, we're hearing about the story of Joseph. Fascinating story, wonderful story. I think you would agree that some of the most amazing characters that you have never met are found on the pages of Scripture. I just love reading about them and the circumstances of their inclusion in the Bible. There's so many interesting Bible characters. There must be hundreds of them. And I'm sure that you have a few favorites of your own. I think it's fair this morning to say that those characters and their stories were not included in Scripture simply because they are interesting. According to the Bible itself, these accounts are included for our particular advantage. That benefit will be found as we study the Word of God. The Apostle Paul has informed us of this matter as he refers to the experience of the Hebrews and their 40-year journey in the wilderness. You may find our reference this morning as it reads in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13. Keep in mind now that the events described in this reference took place about 1,500 years before Paul penned this first letter to the believers in Corinth. And that makes this wilderness expedition of God's people about 3,500 years ago for us. Now, in these few verses to the Corinthians, you may read, 
Paul's brief summary of what happened to God's people right there in the wilderness. Turns out this passage could be included in the well-known Bible chapters that relate to Bible prophecy. Here Paul records the specific challenges experienced by the Israelites there in the wilderness as an introduction to what will be the challenges of the Advent people in the last days. In fact, he lists five specific snares that took God's people off track there in the wilderness. Please note that some of the most treacherous temptations occurred precisely at the end of their journey. This morning we'll deal briefly with a couple of these snares as it fits well with the Bible character that will be mentioned in the presentation today. As Paul concludes his review of the Hebrews' historical challenges, he looks forward with an eye, a prophetic eye, to the temptations that will be facing God's Advent people in the end times. Then we read his summary from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Here it is in the New Living Translation. All these events happen to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the time that this age is drawing to a close. Do you see the prophetic connection here? Ancient literal Israel was called by God out of ancient literal Egypt and led through the wilderness of Zin to the promised land, Canaan. In a similar matter, today, modern Israel is being called by God, modern day spiritual Israel, I should say, is being called by God out of modern spiritual Egypt and is being led through the wilderness of sin into heaven's promised land. Do you feel you're a part of that group? You definitely are. As such, this scripture may be thought of as a call to the Advent people to study those numerous experiences of ancient Israel under the Exodus movement. God has given us these particular accounts which begin in the book of Exodus and continue all the way through the book of Joshua. These five books, they're listed, contain 161 chapters that are given specifically for our advantage. If you read two a day, two chapters a day, you'll be done by Thanksgiving. Might be an interesting read for you. Accordingly, these chapters should receive our careful attention as we are camping here very near the border of the promised land. Amen. Note that Paul is very careful to mention these examples are given for those living in the last days. This helps us to understand that there will be very specific temptations that we will encounter as God's children during these end times. If you haven't done so already, please turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll briefly identify these troubling items. Now, the first four verses basically serve as a preface to what Paul wants to bring to our attention. <clears throat> then in verse 5, he records that there were some campground issues, shall we say, that were displeasing to the Lord. Verse 6 informs us that the campers had a craving for evil things. Verse 7, they fell for idol worship with partying and pagan revelry. Verse 8, they were snared by sexual immorality. Verse 9, they tested the patience of the Lord as they expressed their dissatisfaction with the necessities that he had provided for them. Verse 10, they were lured into 
rebellion, and murmuring. Now, it may be that you're not challenged by any of these temptations. On the other hand, it may be that you are struggling with several of them. Let's understand the nature of this warning as we read Paul's follow-up to these items there in verse 12. If you think you are standing strong, be careful, for you too may fall into the same sin. I hope you understand this morning, this is not an accusation. This is a warning for us all about the nature, the gravity, and the timing of the snares that are laid for the Advent people. Let us also keep in mind what Paul himself must have said many times and in a variety of ways. We're all in this together. This morning, I would like to spend the next few minutes reviewing with you the account of the Hebrews just as they were entering their final approach to the 40-year journey through the wilderness. Moses, as you remember, was within a few weeks, short weeks, of handing camp leadership over to Joshua. You can imagine the eager anticipation they felt as they came closer and closer to the promised land. Just before them was the land of Canaan. So often they have dreamed about it and they longed to finally be there. This was, after all, the land of milk and honey. Now the formal invasion and occupation of Canaan had yet to begin. But according to Numbers 21, they had just completed a sound whipping of those pesky Amorites on the northeast side of the Jordan River. Here you see a map showing us the picture. You notice the Amorites covered a lot of the country right here. Down here, right through, and up to here. The Israelites came from the wilderness by this route went up and in this area defeated the Amorites. So though they were not quite in Canaan yet, you can imagine the air was thick with anticipation. From their camp in the valley of the Acacias, just north of the Dead Sea and just east of the Jordan River, they could gaze westward cross the plain and see Jericho about 12 miles away in the distance. Yes, there was lush Jericho, the city of palm trees, as it was called. On the previous map, you may have seen a little, uh, right, right here, it says Shittim. That's the same as Acacia, okay? So they were camped, if you would advance now, they were camped right in this area, right here, and could look about a 10 to 12 miles across the valley, across the plain. Remember, this is around 800 feet below sea level. And see Jericho sitting over there. So to say they could taste it would be probably the best way to say it. Soon they would possess, you can turn that off now, thank you, Soon they would take possession of that promised land. They would finally be home. But they weren't there yet. You see, there was a storm brewing, the likes of which they had never seen before. Near to their encampment was the land of the Moabites. Just a little farther to the southeast lived the Midianites. Now, I could have showed you, but I forgot to do so on the map. 
the first one, they were basically surrounded by who? Relatives. Down south were the Edomites, the sons and daughters of Esau. Over to the over to the east here was the Midianites. The Midianites were also the sons of Abraham by his third wife, whom he married six years after Sarah passed away. The Moabites, the Moabites occupied this land right in here. And just to the east of them were the Ammonites. Who were they? They're cousins, basically. These were the children of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. So here they were entering a country where they were surrounded by, by relatives. So these two former enemies, that is the Moabites and the Midianites, <clears throat> had formed an alliance. And they did this after hearing about all these supernatural workings of God on behalf of his people. The resultant fear of this alliance that they sanctioned was overpowering to their own people. And they determined that the best way to protect their territorial holdings was to enlist the power of sorcery to counteract the word work of God. This is where Balaam, the son of Beor, enters the equation. You likely know the sordid details of this story. They're found there in Numbers chapter 22 to 25. I would encourage you to read a full account of this story this afternoon or this evening. Also, if you're interested in history, Patriarchs and Prophets has three chapters. That would be 39, 40, and 41, which both of these references will be very beneficial to you. It's, it's very interesting. Now, Balaam was an eccentric, we'll say. He was shifty, a difficult one to figure out. On one hand, he was a prophet of the true God. Yet he was also known to be a magician or a soothsayer who was involved in divinations and incantations. Sometime earlier, Satan had bought into the apostasy of covetousness. For his personal satisfaction, he ardently endorsed the policy of acquisition by compromise. You see, Balaam was dreadfully greedy. According to one source, avarice was his besetting sin. I didn't know what that word meant either, so I had to look it up. <laughs> it means extremely greedy. When I first looked it up, I wrote down on my paper, like greed on steroids. So he was really into it. Now, even from a hasty reading of this story, it's evident that Balaam was an apostate prophet who had perverted his gifts in hope of worldly gain. Further, he was double-minded, which made him especially unstable. Now, aside from the full story that you'll find there in Numbers 22 to 25, there are 10 other Bible references for Balaam. The seven references are found, that are found in the Old Testament basically support the idea that God turned an intended curse on his people into a magnificent blessing for them. The three New Testament references do add a bit to the more distinctive characteristics of Balaam. Let's quickly review those three references, if you will. In 2 Peter 2, verse 15, we find that a reference is made to the dangers of false teachers that are among God's people. We are told that these will wander off the right path and have followed the way of Balaam, 
who love to obtain riches through the wages of sin. Next, Jude 11 basically informs us that there will be some who will run after the error of Balaam who would do anything for money. Finally, in Revelation 2, verse 14, we see that the church at Pergamos tolerated those among them who held to the doctrine of Balaam. This is in reference to Balaam's instigation and collaboration with the Moabite king on how to entice those Hebrews into the worshiping idols and committing sexual sins. This was accomplished by the infiltration of licentiousness into the camp of Israel right there at the crossing of the border. Now the front man for this Moabite Midianite alliance was King Balak of Moab. Somewhere along the way, he had heard of Balaam and his doctrine. You might say that Balaam's reputation had preceded him. So under Balak's re uh, leadership, this alliance agreed to send for Balaam to perform his divinations and his incantations in cursing Israel, the people of God. Now, as incredible as it may seem, Balaam lived a way up north, over 400 miles away. His address was found in northwest Mesopotamia, near the Euphrates River. Today, this location lies between what is known as Carchemish and Aleppo, Syria. You may have heard those names on the news. Briefly reviewed, Balaam was asked by the king of the Moabites to curse the Hebrew nation as they gathered very near the border of the promised land. For this venture, he was offered something that he dearly loved, riches. He knew it was wrong, but he was so intrigued and enticed by the flattery that someone thought so highly of him that they would actually pay him to curse God's people. He did have the sense to pray about the matter, but then promptly disregarded the Lord's answer to his prayer. Hastily, he set out for the camp of the Israelites riding his donkey. Can you imagine riding a donkey from here to Seattle? Think of all the time that God gave Balaam to reflect on what he was doing. One author has estimated that it would take about two weeks to make this trip one way. And by the story's end, it appeared that Balaam made two trips to the camp of the Israelites. Important point. What a merciful God we serve. He is so patient and kind, long-suffering toward us. And the story of Balaam is a good example of that. Now, you likely recall that on the first trip south, Balaam injured his foot and almost lost his life. He would have done so, except the donkey that he was riding was more responsive to the Lord's command than he was. Next, as he attempted to curse God's people, the Lord caused blessings to come out of his mouth instead. Four times this scenario was repeated as Balaam stubbornly attempted to collect on the promise of riches. Yet each time the Holy Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he delivered a prophetic blessing to God's people upon God's people. You can see that Balaam clung tenaciously to his cherished sins. And as he did, he slipped farther and farther from the Lord. Yet all the while, he claimed to be a servant of God. 
Rather uncanny, isn't it? I can remember the story as a kid trying to figure it out. What an unusual story. Turns out that Balaam is one incredible example of where treasured sin will ultimately lead God's people. Eventually, we will acquire a hard heart, which consequently leads to the development of a hard head. And that's exactly what happened to Balaam. Sorry to say that many times others are pulled into the mingle as well, as you will see. The story of Balaam is essentially the account of one human being's attempt to barter with the Lord on how to achieve success in life. It's apparent that Balaam thought that he knew better than his creator and sustainer. In this way, he was much like Lucifer and Cain and Judas. As he proceeded to sanction his own error, his life ultimately slid into moral bankruptcy through the sin of covetousness, compromise, and acquisition. In his persistence to obtain what he longed for the very most, Balaam subsequently assisted the enemies of Israel by bringing idol worship and sexual immorality into the camp. This occurred in a most clever and a most covert way. You see, the Midianite women with their merchandise were introduced into the camp under the cloak of mingling with friendship, fellowship. You know that's how the evil one operates. If he can't destroy God's people from the outside, that is, with outside the camp, he will attempt by infiltration within it. Even Moses and the other leaders were oblivious to the enticement that had been laid for God's people. Tragically, it was Balaam who was instrumental in orchestrating the presentation of this diabolical scheme right in the camp within sight of the border. This disastrous indulgence ended in the untimely death of 23,000 children of God. What a catastrophic event for God's people. It was their worst number of casualties ever. Thousands of victims who heretofore had their hopes and dreams planted decisively on the promised land were abruptly finished with their journey. Sadly, there would be no border crossing for them. What an incredible ending to those children of God who had fallen for the snare set before them right on the border of the promised land. Sadly, they had elected to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So near, and yet so far they were. In the end, the hopeless termination for the wayward prophet came at the hands of the very people he deceived. Joshua records for us in chapter 13, verse 22, that the children of Israel slew Balaam with a sword when they defeated the Midianites in battle. This morning I'm confident that God will help us to recognize the several applicable lessons revealed to us in this most remarkable story. And I would estimate that a person could have three or four more presentations. It's such a remarkable story. I hope you take the option to read it. And there's a lot of interesting things that, that are a blessing to you as you read and study it. But perhaps the most blessed thing about Paul's message is the encouragement that is found 
in God's promise to each one of his faithful children. Let me gladly share with you this undeniable declaration that we find in the next verse, verse 13. But remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different than what others experience. Our God is faithful. Amen. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you just can't stand it. When you are tempted, he will provide for you a way out so that you will not have to give in to it. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that for every warning in God's word, there is an encouraging promise? I'd like to read that promise again. Remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. Our God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you just can't stand against it. When you are tempted, he will provide for you a way out so that you will not have to give in to it. God's promises are a steadfast indication of his marvelous love for us. I hope you really understand that. How grateful we are for this particular promise. Paul informs us that even though there will be specific temptations to deal with, God will make a way of escape for us. How many of you this morning can attest to God's faithfulness and his promises? Praise his name for that. So as we study the various counts of the Hebrews there in the wilderness, let us keep the memory of God's faithfulness before us. And finally, let us carefully consider Paul's sage advice as we navigate toward the border crossing just ahead. Father, we do thank you for your word and the accounts that are found, the characters that are found within it. We thank you for stories that teach us more about what you would like us to do. And we pray that as we live our lives in faithfulness to you, that, that our gratefulness will be overflowing and that we will be attending to the words that you give us. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to us and for the promises that you have given to us, your children. We thank you for this, Father, because we've asked it in Christ's name. Amen.